I think we just have to accept that ultimately organizations that are driven by profit and the products that they sell are actually benefiting from our own misalignment and our own trauma. They don't want you well. You know, in our culture in general, orients away from sadness, grief, anger. Although there's a lot of those things in the world, we teach people that there's a problem with them if they're sad. When you just decide, okay, I have been a victim of things and fuck that. Like, let's go. Victims complain about their life. Champions change it. Thank you for tuning into this episode, people. So many of you do not subscribe who listen. So please, if you find this valuable, click subscribe and interact with me, Mark, in the comments. I'll always endeavor to get back to your questions, comments, whatever it might be. And please share. Many ways you can support. All of that info is in the description. Enjoy the episode with Mark Groves. Well, I think firstly, I don't want to congrats. And actually, how are the estrogen levels? <laughs> I, uh, love, I love that. You know what? I got to go for a follow-up uh, blood test because I got to get that checked out. But they should be down. I feel like my testosterone has has gone up. How are you measuring that? Uh, just like uh, I, <laughs> I was saying actually to a friend of mine that <laughs> which out of context, this would sound bad. But I was like, oh, I now have the energy back that I feel like I want to fuck the world. And my friend doesn't really understand that language. He was like, um, what? <laughs> and I was like, like, I have that energy. Like I want to go out and like create and conquer, not in a bad way, but in like a penetrative way. And he was like, penetrative? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it takes, a, a, you know, a, a, a mind that doesn't use all those words for all the other ways they go. But yeah, I can feel that there's just an energy of creation and desire and direction. Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, I still have the uh, the benefits of uh, what estrogen is supposed to create, which is more attunement to the child. Sure. Yeah, makes sense. It's good to have that context of yeah of what, what happens in those in those times. I've heard so many different theories on like what does happen. And I think men also can go through like a real rejection. I think women can go through that as well. And there's something hormonally that happens. That the, the, the man wants to reject, or and that's a, a mechanism to actually integrate other men into the family, or or you know not be so protective, but also inclusive. And it's like comes a comes across in terms of like that kind of energy, like almost what we'd call just not wanting to be around. Yeah, there's an inter the navigation from um, especially with having children, but that navigation of going from two to three, you know, in a family system is. A very important conversation and not one that's widely held, you know, not one that's had where the couple is encouraged to really explore how do we integrate a third into this unit that we have. Mm -hmm. And so the the couple, the the identity of being a couple has to die. And now we're a family. But also, I think what can happen is, uh, which makes sense, is that the mother becomes very bonded to the child, which is super important. But actually, unconsciously wedges out the father and so there's a two but the two is actually mother and child and the father feels kind of separate and if you talk to a lot of fathers about this that's a, a legitimate experience they have that and, and when i interviewed stan tacken who's like a world-renowned psychotherapist about that he wrote a book on it he said yeah you know the thing that he sees is that any conflict you have in a relationship, whether it's with a child or not, is the opportunity for the two people, the parents, the adults, to strengthen their bond, to always know they have each other's back and they are each other's person, always first ahead of the child. And that's, uh, I think, a really, for a lot of people, that's like, wait, what? Ahead of the child? Yeah, like the two primaries, the decisions are always made by them. The agreements are made by them. And that there's also space for both people's parenting styles. Like you see all this in relationship, you know, people say that people get divorced because of conversations about money. But it's not money actually that leads to divorce. It's that they have two different stories about money that are coming and meeting each other and clashing and re requiring healing. And so when I heard him talk about the frictions being this opportunity, I got you know, kind of excited because I was like, oh, wait, yeah, that's so true. If we orient to the challenges of our life 
from that perspective. Yeah, they're hard, but they're revealing opportunities to grow and become a better couple or a better self. Yeah. A great podcast you did with Nick Solichek, who I had on. And you just took you just honed in on that. It really is like the cosmic joke of of the wound creates the situation or the uncomfort. Um and that creates the opportunity. Because without that showing up, you you don't really know what you're working with. But it's right. the, re- exactly. the ultimate reframe. The other thing I wanted to congratulate you on was and what I loved so much. Um having been observing and listening and paying attention to your work for many years, you reintroducing yourself and you coming back into whole, you know, um, restoring that and how you framed it and just inviting people on that journey with you, you know. I think you've always done that to to really know that you're in the arena. It's been so amazing to just, yeah, be a part of that. And but yeah, like reintroducing yourself and Obviously, it's out of context. People you, you don't even know you, let alone the journey the last two, three years have brought for you. But maybe we can take it back to like starting with like create the love and the person you were you were there. Maybe even when you hit a million, far before anyone I know hit a million on Instagram, and like what that period is, was like and who you've had to let die since then, because there's been mm. many iterations of Mark, right? And I feel like recently you've just, yeah, you've stepped into maybe version two or three or I don't know. I don't know what version yeah. you are at now, but, yeah. you know, there's definitely been a shift. What the- yeah, you know, the birth of, so for people that don't know my backstory, I the first job I had out of college um, was as a pharmaceutical rep. So I worked actually for 14 years in that industry. But while I was in that work i i started at 21 ish 22 and then at 27 i went through a breakup and that made me really wonder i was really good at sales i won lots of awards i loved it and i remember thinking to myself when i went through that breakup why am i so good at talking about everything but my feelings hmm. like this can't be a skill set issue there's something else going on here and so i started to study romantic relationships i wanted to understand why do they last why do they not what makes some thrive and last and others people stay together and don't even like each other all that stuff was just such an inner i felt like i woke up to this craziness that no one was paying attention to like why don't we want to learn this this is probably and i thought that then but it is validated by research now it is the most important skill we could ever learn in our lives so went deep into the science on relationships, which my pharma background enabled me to read studies and understand them, et cetera. And then I started to write about what I was learning. I went back to school, took positive psychology, and I started to just write blogs about what I was learning about myself and offering what I like sort of, it was sort of like a place where I could excise my shame. You know, I could lay down on the, on the sort of the altar the things that I was not proud of and how I'd responded or behaved or what I'd chosen in my life, but giving context to the pathology, like why did I choose those things? What would I do moving forward? So when I started to write, I knew the first time that I ever declared that I was going to teach and write about relationships, I knew that I could never go back to who I was. So there was this declaration. Like What was beautiful is the initiation into making my work actually about my self-expression was that it created a a line of integrity that I knew I couldn't cross. And so I think for whenever anyone's looking to change anything, which is usually looking at changing ourselves in some capacity, usually letting go of perhaps let's call it like a dysfunctional or toxic habit, we need to find something that will keep us in integrity aligned with the new choices. And for me, I found that my work became that place. I knew that if I declared something, Mm -hmm. I couldn't then be a fraud about it. So I started writing. I had a blog that did well. I was dating this woman who ran social medias for companies. And she was like, you should start an Instagram account, you know, for your writing. I was like, and I like looked at it. I'm like, "Eh, it's like pictures and shit. And I, we broke up 
And so I started it. And I remember thinking to myself, like, <clears throat> I would I would post a quote. Back then, you couldn't edit. So, like, you were fucked as soon as you posted. If there was a spelling error, you know, you're just, now you're the person who can't spell. But I I would post and then write about what I what the quote elicited for me. And people would say, oh, you can't write long form content on Instagram. Like, that's not going to work. And, you know, I, I posted every day, twice a day, at one point, three times a day for eight years without missing a single day. Wow. And, you know, about seven years in, I hired someone to do the actual posting, but I was still writing them and, and doing everything. So eight years of just like consistency and showing up, but also learning a lot. And and I think what was interesting, you know, coming back to what you're, you first alluded to this, like allow me to reintroduce myself, is that when Create the Love started to gain momentum, when it started to do well, the Instagram account and my blog was also doing well and my podcast was doing well. It was like unconsciously my identity was being formed about around something that was actually my authentic self-expression. But when COVID started to happen and the pandemic and watching all the conversations, I was still having, I was I didn't orient differently to how I oriented about everything. Like, let's look at this. Does this make sense? Does this not? Lockdowns didn't make sense for me psychologically. There was no data for them. I wondered, why can't you talk about this? This doesn't make any sense. Like, And so these alarm bells were going off for me. And so I would reference these things, but then I would get attacked by, you know, so, a lot of people because they were afraid and et cetera, you know, all the psychological mm -hmm. reasons. And so I started to quiet my voice, not be as self-expressive. And I started to just create content on create the love, but it was starting to feel less authentic because I was feeling like, well, there's a whole part of me that wants to rage about what's actually happening and mm -hmm. the psychological manipulation, which I know in the UK, there's a lot of investigations on how there was a lot of breaches of ethics in how people in the UK were influenced to get the vaccine, to lock down, et cetera. They violated a lot of ethical um, rules in terms of how you influence psychology. And I'm I'm sure for anyone, you can just Google that. It's been released. But there's you know pictures that were used on bus stops and shit that were so fear-inducing. So I'm still there. <laughs> oh, it's just awful. <laughs> it's you, They've made like real life like real signage on some st streets in London that you, you, you know, they're just like, it's like road signage, but it's for COVID. It, it's outrageous. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the, the sort of split in me. So I started a separate Instagram account. It was called it's Mark Groves. And I would share more of my thoughts and opinions on what was going on specifically mm -hmm. on COVID. But then I found that I had these two places of self-expression, but really one was the only place I wanted to be because it felt so topical, which was It's Mark Groves. But I still cared about teaching relational stuff. It was relational. All of this stuff is relational that mm. I'm talking about. Like, if you're unwilling to have break bread and have dinner with someone because they vote for someone different or had took a vaccine or not or had a different opinion, it shows you how how much our capacity for difference has gone down. Mm. Yeah. And you see this same pattern being used psychologically in every topic that if it is discussed, we'll, we will see weaknesses in the position that is the main held position. So gender, um, uh, climate, um, COVID, vaccines, all these different subjects now have one main held perspective that if you hold that, you're a good person, you're not right wing, you're you're doing the right thing, you're caring about other people. So it's the perspective is preserved by righteousness and virtuosity. And what it does is it, if I think I hold the right perspective and you just have a different perspective, but mm -hmm. you're dumb or you just you're just following misinformation. Yeah, yeah. You're a conspiracy theorist, you're right wing, it shuts down any debate, but it also creates a hierarchy so that if I'm the one perceive it and it can happen from any side both sides tend to preserve their perspective with righteousness but i found myself being split just like the split i'm talking about so i had these two places and i was like you know what fuck this like i can't live my life like this like i want one place of self-expression and 
if it burns it all down, I don't want it anyways. Was it a big decision to make for you? Did it feel heavy? Well, it just felt um, like my energy was being divided, that mm. there was something that really mattered to me that I wanted to speak about on a larger scale. Yeah. And I was still doing it on my podcast. But yeah, on my social media, it felt it felt hard in that it was the death of, I'm just going to say, hopefully, the remaining uh, parts of my codependencies, you know, that mm. that I think once we resolve codependency interpersonally, then it, you know, in romantic relationship, which is where it magnifies, like, and really we could think about codependency as being self-abandonment, like putting other people in relationships ahead of our own thoughts, feelings, voice. Once we resolve it in romantic relationships, that's the magnifying glass, but you'll see it in your friendships, you'll see it in your rom in your family relationships, your community, culture. And so I just started to see how so many people around me are silencing themselves that they have, you know, I know so many people who work in this space of mental health. They have a lot of, of, of opinions on what's going on in the gender conversation, but they're not having the conversation because they're afraid of being canceled. They're afraid of losing their jobs. You know, and I get that when you tie someone's survival to them speaking out or having a different opinion than a group, uh, they'll very often silence themselves. And I, I'm sure a lot of people know the famous perspective from Dr. Gabor Mate that all humans have two needs, the need to be authentic and self-express and the need to belong. But when self-expression threatens belonging, belonging usually wins. And that's an evolutionary behavior. You know, we're, we're meant to hold opinions and values that are similar to the group that we're in. But when, when there's a, a cultural norm says you do not disagree with anything anymore and if you do we're going to call you names and make you something that means you don't fit in anymore and i've just seen that happen so much and now i'm like i don't want to fit in like if fitting in means pretending we don't hold on to reality anymore i don't want it mm. yeah you said your inaction is a decision and it's linked to you self-sabotaging and i think when you're in this space, when you, you you stand for something and that's written on the tin, you know it's it's like this is the, this are the values that I have and and this is what I'm you know this is what I'm speaking to you constantly. And if you're not in that truth, it's not right or wrong. And and I, of course, the people that are going to get cancelled if they do speak out of it or lose their job, like there is a there is a real cost there. Yeah, absolutely. But, but ultimately, like coming back to to what your values and what you're standing for, like, and if you're someone in the in the space of transformation and and speaking directly to that truth, then it's gonna it's gonna constantly keep coming back around and inability your ability, like stifle your ability to actually show up and get what exactly it is you want, and that's freedom, really, in in all aspects. Um. So yeah, it's it's only. It's, it's it's also these laws that we revolve around because all of this is language and and I guess decisions to be made, but it's all like vibrational frequencies ultimately that we're making or not making that is conducive to our health. Because not speaking, not making a decision can be quite stressful. To know yeah. something and not speak about it can be really like stagnant for the body for the for, and it just can in it can happen you, we, you know people that don't speak up they don't speak out and what does it do to their body what their posture is like and how, how does it manifest in the body and it's uh it's important to to recognize where you are and aren't showing up and you said this beautiful thing which was like stop pretending that you don't want more and i, I love that because it's like everyone does but it's just really tuning back into the values. Yeah, it's a wild thing to think that I was I was laugh kind of in a dark way at you know who in a relationship if I said to you, hey, like we should create a relationship where both of us actually use our relationship to be liberated. That like you be all of you, I'll be all of me. And Let's speak all the truths, all the fears we have, and 
and and bring out the best in one another and in ourselves on a, you know through the reflections that we experience in life and through the relationship i mean who wouldn't want that everybody wants that but to actually live that means that your ego has to die that means that you're going to hear from your partner the real truth which is sometimes i don't like you you know so i'm not happy i feel like we take each other for granted you know and those are truths that exist anyways i think about it in the context you know there's when when something's wrong with a man they don't tend to go to the doctor right because they're afraid of what they'll find out and that's true of humans in general but more so of men but it's like you knowing what's real what's actually going on allows you to act on the information you pretending that you don't know is not actually you're just living in a fantasy land it's not real you don't actually not know and so trying to pretend that we don't know things or don't believe things or don't see things actually requires us to carry around a lot of anxiety and and ultimately will lead to depression because we are depressing reality we're we're depressing the truth and you see this in the context of every conversation that we don't seem to be able to hold the complexity of two different experiences which the, even the idea that we reduce it to two is ridiculous <laughs> but that seems to be the only option now is you you can only be in one binary or another and i never thought i'd be at the day where i mean i grew up in the in alberta which is in canada which is like the texas of canada so it's very conservative i spent the last 10 years in vancouver which is very liberal like you you basically can't have a conservative view or you fall off the cliff into the ocean never to be seen again you know and i always did i always have held more liberal views because i like social programs i want equality you know those things are all important to me but i never thought i would see the day that those who identify as the left because i don't believe it's actually libertarian are pro censorship are pro war are pro pharma like when did you ever think what is called the left wing would be vehemently pro pharma and so we have this different i i think what's challenging is that the shadow side of the right or what may be called the right wing i'm only using these terms because they allow people to create a construct in their mind of what we're talking about and everyone knows the shadow side of the right but the shadow side of the left mm. is that it doesn't believe its own shit stinks and any human that is not aware that it, there are weaknesses or flaws in our our identities our beliefs our perspectives means that we are not open to feedback on them but what happens and coming back to what i said about going to the doctor is that we know there are we know there are flaws to our perspective mm. and so when we deny and censor conversations to try to protect and preserve our perspective our perspective is actually incredibly fragile and it requires no discussion because if discussion exists our perspective dies and so i think it's going to take this immense amount of information that makes it so people can't help but know the truth can't help but actually acknowledge the weaknesses in our perspectives which is you know what all healthy relationships are created upon is the recognition that you have one view your partner has another and actually neither of you are right there's actually a deeper truth if we can get in a dialogue that exists beyond that those two perspectives and that's why we're always made wiser by diversity whether that's diverse of race culture perspective opinion information we always are and so i i hope that we return to that i think we are because it seems like there's a cultural movement now um i don't want it to be a complete backlash all the way back but you know you're starting to see people elected around the world who are you know per perceivably anti-socialist you know or what they ever they might be called i think someone was just elected in i think it was argentina mhm mm what benefits me is knowing that nothing's true or there are many sides of it but everything's real so everything's real for you for me right. what you think and feel is real for you and just how can i honor that more than more than ever like can i lean into what 
you think and what your identity and what your ideas are, they are really real for you. And with that brings in like a different lens of viewing it, not to say like, I need to label to then create further separation, but it's like trying to lean into someone else's experience. If COVID taught me anything, it was that I have a bias and I created a group full of men that I didn't agree with any of them. And I just, how uncomfortable is it just to be in a room with people you just don't agree with? You you start to like ask yourself who you are. You really, if you really have like an identity crisis because, or you either really know and you stand in your power or it's just confusing. Um, but do you think it is a stress response or a trauma response to have those like black and white thinking? I remember reading, um, I can't remember the the author, but how to how to deal with emotionally immature parents. Um, oh yeah, I forget what that's called. <laughs> it's phenomenal. The subheadings great as well. Um, but yeah, it, it talked about black and white thinking, and I was like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, my dad just doesn't have room for anything else. It's either this way or that way. And it's yeah. it is this 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 just stress response that just hasn't got the capacity to think they might be not correct about something. Yeah, I think you nailed it. You know, if there's uncertainty, then I'm unsafe. Mm. You know, like so much of the marketing for the vaccine at the beginning was like safe and effective. You know, all these lines that they couldn't actually show in data, 100% stops transmission, not shown in a clinical trial. You know, but it was like there was so much circulating fear because whenever in our lifetime has there been a death count on the news and the language being like, the only way out of it is this thing and lockdowns potentially. And I mean, you saw the goalposts keep moving, but what was really interesting is because there was so much circulating fear and then the solution to the fear and anxiety is herd immunity, take this product, comply, comply, comply. And anyone who criticizes the product or criticizes the non-pharmaceutical intervention like masks or whatever it might be, lockdowns is a threat to us getting out of this. So that's why you saw people and continue to see people who can't actually, you could show them all the data in the world. Mm -hmm. It will never change their opinion because it's emotional. It's not logical. And when we are in fight, flight, freeze, fawn, we are being operated by our amygdala. And so what the first thing to go is your prefrontal cortex, which is in charge of critical thinking, You see this in interpersonal relationships in the data that couples who have really high levels of conflict, their bodies are always in fight, flight, freeze around each other. They're always in a dysregulated state, even if they're not arguing. And in other research, it's shown that people who are in high conflict relationships actually heal slower. So they actually have, in terms of wound repair, they heal slower. So you have all these different things that show us that like high conflict, not good for us and doesn't help critical thinking. And one study on workplaces where they say to people, can I give you some feedback? Just that statement alone will have, so people can't problem solve. They're not capable of actually dialoguing because they're already protecting themselves from getting criticism. And so I think, you know, when we look at what shapes our world today, to be like this, I think social media has really amplified, you know, the the echo chambers that we're in, no matter which chamber we're in. Being in a perceived binary of two choices of opinion allows us to be against each other. It really works well for the people who want to influence us. Mm. Uh, companies, marketing works great on dysregulated people. Like anyone, what we really want is to buy more shit when we're dysregulated. We want more food. You usually more processed food, usually more sugary food. And I'm not saying this is like a grand conspiracy no. to keep us terrified. It's, the, it's just what the data shows. Oh, well, this set of people who watch TV a lot, they mm-hmm. eat more, so let's market to them, whatever it might be. And now it's just thrown into a machine that pumps out the, the, the exact data of what it takes to buy your product more. And that's exactly it. Exactly, right? It's like these systems just happen to work really well together, you know? And if you're more sick and you eat a lot of sugar and you're dysregulated and depressed and traumatized and don't know a way out, and now you've, you know, you're not talking to people in your family because you have different political views, different whatever. Now you don't have a social system of support, which is really important for your nervous system, for healing, for health. So now you've lost a lot of your village. 
And so we could just sell you more food and we can also sell you pharma products to help fix it all with this solution. I mean, look at Ozempic. Ozempic is crazy fat, which is a, mm. a diabetes drug that's showing significant results in weight loss. But at the end of the day, we're not getting to the behaviors. You know, that's everyone wants to get on it who's obese or overweight. But we're still always trying to skip the struggle. Like we live in this world where we're just trying to skip the struggle. Convenience has been the death of us, you know, literally. You know, we've never been more sick, yet we've never had more modern technological solutions. You know, I think people are starting to wake up to that, though. You know, you're seeing the data on things like um, Bayer, I think, just paid a big payout for glyphosate, you know, which you can't even use it in the UK, but you could use it. In, I think you could still use it in the US, you know, in making food. Um, if not, it was a recent change. But that's what I mean is like all these things that we're trying to grow more food and extract more from the planet. Yeah. It just makes us not well. Look at all the plastics we're drinking and eating. Mm. You know, it's like it's reducing our sperm count. We're walking around with high levels of circulating estrogen from all the cups we're drinking out of. You know, this convenience, what we're being sold as convenience is actually leading to a lack of health. Mm hmm. Do you follow this stop oil, all the protests that are happening in the UK? No. For so what? It's, it's, it's kind of an iteration of Extinction Rebellion. I'm sure you've heard of them. Yeah. So they're just, it feels like it's going to just go on. People are just going to commit to it for the rest of their lives. It like has that flavor to it that people are just wearing orange jackets, spray painting orange on parliament buildings because the government keep passing legislations and further contracts to drill and extract and go deeper in the ocean and, and do all this until there's no more. And then we're in even, even more of a kind of debilitating situation, but it, it, they're just getting creative and it's almost like a lifestyle for people to just protest and make noise about these things. And there's, there's been loads of kind of those things over the past, but it just, it just, it does feel that some people are just committed now more than they ever have been because they're, they're witnessing it. They can see a podcast. They can listen to a podcast on, climate and ecological disaster and and just be a part of the conversation now like it, 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 ha, it is shifting it has to shift because the the same tool is it's using to disconnect us is also connecting us at the same time yeah the irony of that hey <laughs> yeah so on this on this kind of really visceral example of what it's like to and i i think this overarch is like and why you've what i get from why you've chosen to just just be really integrated with it all is because it starts at the family it starts with yourself it starts with your relationships and if you're not able to sit across the table with your family your partner and have a conversation that's nuanced and is not rooted in ideology or just you know your own bias like that has to happen for growth for, for for meeting people, you know, there's a field. I'll meet you there. It's like meeting people on the other side of these fences that you that you're across. So it really does. It's not really about COVID. It's not really about the thing. It's what it represents in our inability or our stress or trauma attached to, in our wounds attached to like not being able to connect with each other, human to human. And it comes back to that. So what what do you think is the best way to communicate to someone that just doesn't isn't aware of their own stuff like because there's so many people that listen to this podcast will will know this that they, they they have these conversations but i think the real work is like how can we create that bridge how can we start to communicate things in in like a real healthy way with people that don't get it or are not quite there yet they're not on the bus they're not at the bus stop they've kind of they don't even know the bus exists you know I think you said something really, you know, insightful earlier where you were just talking about how you were surrounded by a group of men, but you you really saw your own bias. Mm. And when I got angry and defensive at the fact that I wasn't allowed to talk about things that I felt every right to speak about, I started to create echo chambers. You know, I pushed away people who I felt judged by or not safe psychologically with. So I actually became everything I was fighting against. Mm. So I think when we can enter our own 
when we can explore our own psyche and our own behavior from the perspective of like from a humble place to see, oh, how, how am I actually creating the very thing I'm supposed to be rooting against, mm. you know, or, or even the idea of against, you know, just creates more resistance. And I think the solution, you know, I'm still in the, in the drawing room on, on how to do this because I'm living it. And, and I haven't drawn a map for it, but I would say that the starting place is curiosity. You know, I, in the UK, you're probably, you've probably watched from a distance. I watched from a distance how the U S has become so divided politically. And I see that in the UK occurring. I see that in Canada occurring. You see it all over now with this idea of left versus right. And I I'll often say to people, like, if you didn't invite someone to Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever your holiday is, or just a family dinner because you don't like who they voted for. Like you don't like what they did or didn't do with something like our relationships. When we talk about unconditional love, we love to use that term. Uh, unconditional love. I love, love. I love. Un no, you don't. You like conditions. You like that. The love is convenient, that it doesn't challenge your perspectives. But, you know, can you love somebody and have a different perspective than them? Like one of my family members and I vehemently disagree on pretty much everything from the last three years. But I feel closer to that person than I've ever been wow. because we don't talk about it very often because it's a little too inflammatory for that person. You know, their their nervous system gets really activated and I don't. And I'll say, hey, like. I notice you're really activated, which just often makes people more activated, you know, but what I, it's really the training the last three years has given me is to really honor that if someone is pro censorship, pro pharma, pro whatever, that I really want to understand like what fear is motivating that. Like if I start to ask them questions, mm. why did you vote for that person? I'm really curious. Like I'm genuinely, and I, I saw in the U.S., like just having so many friends and family in the U.S., that people couldn't even talk about. If you mention the name Trump, people would lose their mind. And they would just go off on how much they hate this person. And and then, you know, and on my podcast, when someone would sort of uh, facetiously mention Trump, I would get a, a one-star review because someone who liked Trump would be mad that someone on my podcast, you know, you like the podcast, but you hate that he was defamed. And it made me just see like, wow, I'd like to know why someone voted for Trump. Like, what did he speak to for you? Like, what fear do you have? What, what, what way is the other perspective to not, not reflected or, or, or um, offering you a solution to a problem you have? Hmm. And I think if we can approach it from that, then we at least embody what we hope to create. You know, we might notice we shut down. We might notice we get reactive. You know, and I've really practiced repairing with people that I pushed away and also saying like, you might not have known this or things I might have said might have really triggered you. Because, you know, here I am saying like, make your own choice, be sovereign. But to someone else who's in a completely dysregulated state who's like, the only way out of this is whatever solution i'm i'm now really activating them and i'm not open to their fear so i think that's the first part is just embodying deep curiosity when mm -hmm. someone can't have that conversation because they're not interested in curiosity on social media if it's someone i don't know i just block them i have no interest in wasting time with people who are not one, it's usually people with a private profile, so they're not even in the arena, you know, like they're not even doing it. They have a cat profile picture I always joke about, you know, it's like. Yeah, I started inviting people on, people on the podcast. I'm like, do you want to jump on? Like, I'll be open to it, but I doubt they would, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the most <laughs> aggressive negative reviews I got, I was like, oh, man, it'd be really interesting just to interview them. Just to like find out, like, if any, just to be able to say, like, if I can meet you with curiosity, because you've met me with so much judgment. Yeah. What an opportunity, you know? But much like in romantic relationships or relationships in general, people have to be willing to at least walk on the bridge with you. 
you know, they have to be willing to at least, you know, it's like when I, when a couple's really struggling and they're like, one of them is like, let's go to therapy. And the other one's like, yeah, but they're not there. You know, they just said, yeah, because they felt they had to. Often you'll see someone who's had an affair, still continuing the affair and also at therapy. So, you know, it's like, you, I think the important part is, can we model it? Mm-hmm. And then can we make sure that at least if we're inviting people to that place, we're not trying to force them to go there. Mm-hmm. Like that family member of mine has no interest in my perspective. Like none at all uses all the words that every troll on the internet uses about my perspective. And uh, now I just kind of see it as a gift. You know, I didn't yeah. used to. I used to get activated myself. Yeah, I think give them what you want from them almost. And give them what you desire. But one thing I remember saying to this family member, but I say to anyone I disagree with, is like, I really respect your perspective. Mm-hmm. Like, I really genuinely do. I respect where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one person said back to me, I don't respect where you're coming from. I said, well, then we can't even start because you don't see any value in what I'm saying. So we yeah. have to also see value in what they're saying. Even if we vehemently disagree, there is value in what they're there saying. There is. If they're really passionate about it, you can praise their passion. And if that could save lives, you know, if it was channeled in a in a in a way that, you know, you both agree on, whatever it might be. But there's definitely energy there that is useful. <laughs> yeah. It's such a loving energy because it's really saying there's wisdom in your suffering. Just like I want you to see wisdom in mine. So, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity that the polarization of our world is offering, which is contrast, which is which means we get to come back to unity. And I think for me, that's been, I knew about that. I'd lived it, but I never lived it in this sort of container of like, I never thought I, the world would be the way it is today. I never thought that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about you. Did you? No, but that inspires me to n- not know what's possible. Like the most inspiring thing about COVID was that we can change the world in in a couple of months. Like can flip everything right. on its head. Wow. We look at what we can do if we like, you know, if have we the really want to. <laughs> right. Like, could we feed the whole world? Yeah, for yeah. sure. What about all the money we put into lockdowns and masks and all that? Can you imagine you know, the marketing of the vaccine? Imagine what we could have done for lifestyle, health choices. You know, I think we just have to accept that ultimately organizations that are driven by profit and the products that they sell are actually benefiting from our own misalignment and our own trauma. They don't want you well. Yeah. And that isn't like some grand, I don't think lizards are running the world. It's not a conspiracy. It's like, it just goes against everything to do with profit. And so when an organism, like an organization, has to respond to shareholders to increase shareholder value, mm-hmm. then they have to do everything they can. They don't give a shit about your feelings. They don't, to someone dying of cardiovascular disease because they've mainlined sugar their whole lives, because that's all that's been offered in their neighborhood, that's the only education they've gotten, it's not their fault. But they don't give a shit about the person in the neighborhood that that's happening to. They don't care about the families that have fallen apart from the dialogues and the way that they position people's perspectives. They don't give a shit. So the greatest act of rebellion is to give a shit, is to actually embody everything they're trying to get you not to embody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They'll validate it some way or the other. It's just like the Holocaust. It was validated. The actions that they take, that they took were valid. They they validated it in some way. They found a way to just justify it, and we all have little micro elements of that in our day to day. How we're validating that chocolate bar, or how we're kind of, you know, accepting the decisions that we're making based on our own narratives. But it it happens at that level too. And to make a decision for yourself to prioritize what is actually conducive to growth is going to change everything because what you value is going to change you know the decisions you make and the, the where the money goes and that is that is changing for sure i think one yeah, of the big, the biggest themes in 
your work and it's kind of in the name of create the love is that creation energy and choosing you talk a lot about choosing so like changing lanes a little bit maybe back to self it's like on some level we are co- we're co-creating our own demise like what where do you think this stops in terms of the individual because you could apply it everywhere and it's probably been the most empowering thing i've ever done is stop blaming and stop thinking things are happening to me and things are happening for me so and everyone kind of gets that when you say it but at what point do you think you are creating you are choosing the situations that are happening to you which aren't conducive to your growth yeah you know there's always this uh delicate line mm-hmm. where you know you might say well the world's happening coaching speak you. isn't it it's like it, it's marketing and it it's true, but then it's when does it get like when does it push people away? That narrative of like, yeah. you know. Well, I think it'll put the idea that the idea that the world happens for you and someone's been through complex trauma or trauma in general feels very minimizing when we're still in the wound of the trauma or still haven't processed it. So you know, you have two options when you look at your past. One, that everything is serving your evolution and your development, or it isn't. And one of those perspectives is empowering, and the other one isn't. One will keep you in an, a, a state of martyrdom, a state of victimization. See, I think often when we talk about victim mindset or being a, you know, being a victim, not a victim of an event, but like our mindset and the way we face the world is it's not fair. Everything happens to me. It's not like it's always me. Whoa, 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 whatever it is. When we actually explore that kind of dialogue and take on potentially the other perspective, the other perspective is empowering. But how do we hold that bridge where I really am, I can acknowledge what I've been through that is unfair. You know, like if you've been through childhood trauma, you've been abused, you you know, you had an alcoholic mother, an abusive father, maybe your dad left. Like imagine saying to someone who still is in that wound, Mm -hmm. oh, it's happened for you. You know, like imagine if someone's like, oh, yeah, my uncle just passed away. And they're like, oh, how do you think that happened for you? Right. There's a bypassing that can occur through the positivity. And I think that's often what actually occurs. But that also is negating the idea that there's not super amounts of value in our grief and in loss. You know, in our culture in general, orients away from sadness, grief, anger, right? Although there's a lot of those things in the world, we teach people that there's a problem with them if they're sad, you know, as opposed to, well, if your life circumstances bring out sadness, then how do we change your life circumstances? you know, and actually use the information of the emotion you're having and seeing the value in it. We tell people that they're broken because they're sad. Well, if their life circumstances dictate sadness, that's pretty shitty. Mm -hmm. Like take this pill, you'll be better. Or start a gratitude journal, everything will be better. You know, not to say that there can't be value in those things. So the radical revolution that we just have to decide, which isn't going to clean it up in one moment, but is just to start to Instead of running from life, we start to run towards it, which is saying, okay, well, if, we're, if, if life happens for me, where's all the unexplored curriculum I've gone through that I haven't learned from yet? And then we get to go through our past, however old we are, and we get to see how we've benefited from being in martyrdom. Terry Cole calls it a secondary gain. Like you get a you get a gain. It's just it looks like it comes from powerlessness, but you're gaining power from the, the representation of powerlessness. So if you can get real with yourself about that, oh shit, now we're cooking. Now we're like, oh, I do benefit from that. Man, I start a lot of my conversations with my wounds, with the things I've been through. Oh, does do I do that to elicit empathy to make it so people have to give me more or feel bad for me? And so that line, when you just decide, okay, I have been a victim of things and fuck that, like, let's go. I remember Grant Cardone saying something along the lines of victims complain about their life, champions change it. And I love that, but that feels very minimizing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 
at some point we have to stop coddling people. You know, it's like, here's how you benefit. Like you could stay in that mindset and your life can suck. Because also when we're stuck in a traumatized victim mindset, we have more autoimmune, we have more health issues because we're constantly in conflict with ourselves. You know, our possibility, our potential. I think about that. The soul is trying to come alive and trying to bring us experiences that are trying to wake us up. Like we keep dating someone who's a shithead. And then we're like, oh man, everybody on Tinder is a shithead. Well, that's not true. It's just that there's something in your programming that keeps leading you to this person, this type of person that you can one day say, I'm going to learn from this. Because usually if you make one or two different choices in the dating process, but just in the way you orient to life, like you wake up in the morning and you take a deep breath and you go, oh, thank you for this breath. Like, how should I be of service today? What's possible for me today? If I was in that space of being a champion of my life, what's one thing I'd create today? Just one thing. And, you know, that's how we can start to access this immense possibility. Because I, I agree with you. I think that the world is delivering us experiences mm -hmm. and we are navigating ourselves towards those in order to be brought most to life. Like I think of all the things in the last three years that... I wouldn't wish upon anyone experiencing again. But I'm also like, wow, I've I've cultivated a deep sense of understanding and compassion for different perspectives that I never had. So without it, there'd be no gift, you know? And I think we have to look at what you said about the mm -hmm. how fast we can change the world. Oh my God, we changed the whole world in two months. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we use that from a not manipulative place. like. But it starts with us. Yeah. Something that popped in was the, I asked God for strength and he gave me difficult uh, situations to face. I asked God for wisdom and he gave me problems to solve. I asked for prosperity. God gave me brain and brawn to work, the courage. I asked for God for courage and God gave me dangers to overcome. I asked God for love. He gave me people to help. So it's like in these opportunities that we get to just live the experience. Like it makes so much sense to me that we have to, and I have to stop looking for like black and white answers. It's like to stop, to, it's the dance. It's the constant dance, the toing and froing of, okay, it's not as simple as saying, okay, that I'll choose to um, not bypass and that happened for me, but that, that needs more work and i just you know it's not as black and white as that it's constant kind of feeling into all these experiences and just seeing it as it, all as a playground to just get to experience the whole spectrum of it have you seen the egg on youtube no i'm going to send it to you it's a it's, it's it's an interesting idea it's about reincarnation but ultimately it's about this planet this ecosystem that we all live on is an egg and you are born into it, but you are constantly being reincarnated into other iterations of you. So you are me, I'm you. And you just, you, it's constantly going around until you learn the lessons. And that feeds into kind of Eastern mysticism around, you know, reincarnation, which I'm on the fence about, but it makes sense. And I choose to play with it as an idea because like, of course it's a, it could be, it could be like a, a, a ground to just, constantly understand more and just to learn and grow and it's like growing out and that, it, that's what it feels like when you when you get something and you, you just work through it and overcome it and then start to teach it and then start to like know it do it be it and it it's just it's yeah i mean in your um video it talks about turning your mess into your message love that and that's yeah and that's what you've chosen to, do you feel like it's been a choice of like stepping into that or just a, what's made sense for you? Well, I, just, I think I just see so many people struggling with similar things that I've struggled with that, mm -hmm. you know, when I went through a breakup, I was like, well, what happens if I actually just talk about everything I'm going through? Yeah. You know, and that was so transformative for so many people because I think we often, you know, there's a narcissism to our pain that we believe we're the only ones who have experienced whatever it is we've experienced. But 
you know, that that's the trick of the pain is it tries to isolate us. But really, when we start to share what we're learning, what we're going through, how we've navigated things, uh, we see ourselves in other people. And and we also give each other permission to have imperfections, to be on a journey. So I think a lot of that is, is really just, um, you know, when I think of turning your mess into your message, it's like everything you've been through, you're qualified to talk about. Yeah. Expert and, you know, experience. So, yeah. And and if you found your way through that, someone might actually need the solution you came up with, with how you did that. So I've just, although there is a fear of being on that edge of, of creation, of, of sharing vulnerable things, uh, there is also a recognition that I feel like I've really been given a gift that I'm I'm capable through the experiences that I've had in my life and continue to have of articulating things that I go through and how I see the way through that for a lot of people puts into words what they don't know how to put into words. So all of a sudden, a somatic feeling they have is like a line and, and now they have the framework. And I think that, you know, much like what you do, it's through having conversations, which isn't that ironic. It's like the solution to everything is conversation solution to everything is communication you ask everybody what's the number one way to have a good relationship everyone goes oh communication yet we're shit at it usually mm. you know look conversations that are convenient and feel good oh yeah that's great no relationship that's good is born in that it's more of fake bullshit like look how much of the world we're injecting what does Brene Brown say we take fat from our ass and put it in our face like it's just more fake we don't want to age you know, we're putting steroids in our body, you know, like we have all these ways that we try to hack the biological experience of life. And I'm like, nah, let's get back to the grid. Let's get back to nature. Let's get back to what it's like to sit with people in tribe who have different perspectives and know that the tribe is enriched through that. You know, I think there's a real, you see a lot of jokes on social media about buying a farm with your friends, you know, <laughs> you know, you see all that. And maybe it's just the algorithm feeding it to me. But I really sense that I've worked a lot more in person with people in the last year. And I really sense this desire for community that goes beyond the internet. That yeah. is like, I want to be in ritual with people. I want to be in communion with people. And I was at this talk that was on diversity um, in Vancouver. And the woman started out by saying, you know, what happens a lot when you're, like for me, I'm Irish. My mom's from Dublin. My dad's from from Canada, the U.S., originally from the U.K. and France. And I remember her saying, like, everyone in this room is indigenous to somewhere. Mm. And I hadn't really thought about that. You know, I'd like done meditation. I'd done all these Eastern practices. But I never really thought about, like, my Celtic origins like what ceremonies and such did my celtic ancestors have like wow what an opportunity to actually dive into like what my body would recognize as home mm -hmm. so it made me go on this journey of wanting to learn stories and wanting to you know sit around a fire and have conversations again i feel like we're on that though there's like an analog revolution that is really on the precipice of happening as we go more to ai you know, I think a group of us will go to the singularity and the other group of us will return to Earth. Yeah. And I don't know that they'll be yeah. different. Like maybe we'll use AI to do that on some mm -hmm. level. But, you know, it's not like we have to throw out all the tools because we don't know how to use them. But I think the tools use us currently for the most part. And so we don't know how to have a healthy relationship with the tool. Beautiful way to end it, brother. Yeah, man. Um, I see that too. I see that too. I feel that. And that's all I want to do is return and remember and lean into those things which are free and accessible. And I, it actually only hit me yesterday when I heard it that we didn't write things down very much. It was a very recent invention, like writing things down. So like the myths and the stories, they had to be pretty strong and they had to be pretty catchy. So like there's a lot of fucking wisdom there within the myths that were told and the stories that were told about what to make space for and what to like essentially like use as a guiding light and 
it's so powerful when you when you look back at like what was guiding people back then and it was story it was communication it was how to make sense of the world but for your survival but also for your for your connection which is rooted in survival had to be connected to survive yeah. so it's yeah it's amazing man and there's so many people diving back into that um over here i went to a druid's temple yesterday and it was it was just something else apparently it's only 200 years old it didn't feel like that but there's just there's just there's richness to to the land and if we if we do like go on that journey to to understand what our lineages are and what our roots are it, it, it just the body just feels it and you can it's just this process of just remembering what it does feel like to have a home and belong and and what the people who um who live beyond the the romans and and you know what was erased over time and and the songs and the and the reclamation of all that um yeah but anyway um i want to say man i love what you do i you out of many most people i just have a you know not much i disagree with you on it's it's you stand out on the podcasts and i'm just so grateful for the opportunity to to sit with you and just and just yeah just talk talk shit and a lot more and uh it's been good connecting with you man really has appreciate what you're doing and what you're able to just step into and just keep showing up for it's really really seen man and yeah how can i contribute you know how can i help i will uh well thanks so much man i really (laughs) appreciate it thanks for trusting me with your audience too and Mm -hmm. having me on your podcast and having this conversation and um, creating the space that you do. Yeah. Thanks, man. And anything else you want to leave us with? What is you, what are you excited about right now? Like what, what are you, what's in the, I feel like there are, there is excitement building in a, in a refinement of how you're showing up on the podcast and, and the production level of it. And it's, yeah, I just feel that there's like, a, there's a newness to it and a, and a refocus on like that side of things. Yeah, there's definitely been a deeper investment in it. I read the book, uh, (laughs) 10X is Easier Than 2X. Okay. And it was, oh man, it's so good. If you haven't read it yet, it's so good. Um, So for me, that was like, yeah, where if I really want to double down on the things I love, Mm -hmm. why am I doing things I don't? It doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I think that when we become disconnected from a part of ourselves, we become disconnected from the intuitive sense of what's right and wrong for us, the direction we want to take, because we're not listening to the current directions that are being given. And so that for me was, has been really big. So we have a book launching in April and it's available for pre-sale. It's called Liberated Love. My wife and I wrote it together and it's about our journey, but also the actual steps we went through to be liberated through relationship, whether you're in a relationship or not it's relevant. Uh, it's about using the container of relationship to get fully liberated and, and really alive in life. And, uh, I think it's the most potent container for that. Otherwise I've got, I'll be doing a podcast slash book tour, uh, starting probably in like beginning of February. Mm -hmm. So that can all be found on markgroves.com. Uh, huh. is that in America? They're doing that. You know what? I'm actually coming to, uh, I'm going to Scotland in June. And so I'm going to do something in Scotland, in Ireland, and in, I think in London. So uh, I'll have to give you a heads up when I'm going up over there. Yeah, man, definitely. Exciting, exciting times. (laughs) Thanks a lot, man, for having me. Good stuff, man. Yeah, appreciate you, brother. Thank you, people. Thank you for listening all the way to the finish really appreciate your time you clearly found it valuable as you listen to all the way to the end if you like more then please subscribe click the bell and you can access more content here